Don't do it. Okay, welcome back. Uh, our next talk is um, Staying Lean from Small Startup Through Rapid Growth at Spotify. Um, and I'm very excited about this one because a couple of weeks ago I had the opportunity to meet these guys at Spotify and have a look at the real life there. So uh, I know that the stuff they're talking about is not made up, it's real. <laughs> And um, I know the uh, Wi-Fi is a little bit unreliable, but if you have the chance to tweet, um, here are the uh, Twitter handles of the speakers, Joachim Sundern and Anders Iversong. Um, yeah, hashtag again, LKNA13. And yeah, let's go. Thank you. So, great to see so many people here. I'm Anders Iverson. I'm one of the agile coaches at Spotify, and I've been with Spotify for approximately a year and a half. And I'm Joachim Sundia. Uh, I beat uh, Anders with a few weeks, starting in August 2011. And uh, I'm also an agile coach at Spotify, and uh, co-author of an upcoming book, uh, Working Python Handbook in Action. You can find uh, a copy and browse through it. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk about Spotify and as I say a bit about how we've stayed lean from being a really small startup a couple of years ago to how we work today and how we kind of try to grow and still keep being really lean and being really fast. Um, we're probably not going to have time for questions during the talk, so please save your questions for afterwards. We'll be happy to take them in the corridors or just join us for lunch today. So just shortly. If Anyone in here doesn't know what Spotify is? We're a music streaming service, so basically we want to make music available to you everywhere on any device. And our goal is to make sure that you have the right music for every moment. Uh, super short facts about Spotify. We have now more than 6 million paying subscribers, 24 million active users. Um, we have more than 20 million songs on the service and we're adding like 20,000 new uh, every day. So it's growing very fast. Our users have created more than a billion playlists, and since a few weeks back, we're available in 28 different countries. Um, we have offices across the world. Uh, so we, ha we have a small office in basically in every country where we've launched a service. Uh, but our main development offices are in Stockholm. That's where we started the company. Uh, we also have a big company, oh, sorry, a big office for development in New York a smaller one in Gothenburg, and a team in San Francisco as well. Uh, so all in all, we're currently around 350 engineers in the co company, and they're spread out over like 40 different teams in those four locations. The company in itself is probably around 850 people. Those numbers change every time I talk about Spotify, so it's a bit hard to keep track. But I think we're around 850 people today. So. Spotify is going really, really fast. If you go back three years in time, Spotify had 30 engineers sitting in Stockholm just hacking away on the desktop client. So everyone was sitting in the same small office and 30 developers. And today, three years later, we're 350 people. So it's, we've grown by more than 10 times it's just in just three years. But we're not growing just because we think it's good to be a good big company. We're not growing just to become big. That's not our goal. We really are doing this because we want to change the world and how people consume music. And so we have all those great ideas and great things that we want to do. And we, we think we need to be a lot of people to be able to do that. But it also means that we can't allow ourselves to become slow when we grow. And that's fairly common that we see in, in different companies that they become slower as they grow bigger. And that's really not acceptable to us because we have all those great ideas that we want to just make sure they happen. So our, our, one of our key challenges is how do we stay fast and as we scale to be, becoming a bigger company? Yeah, and we think that uh, uh, a key, key to that is to be uh, autonomous. We believe very much in uh, autonomy as a key principle for our, our company. And uh, uh, we want to hire really great and passionate people. We have very high hiring standards. And we've been very privileged uh, with having people joining us coming from across the world, moving to Sweden or New York just to, to work with us at Spotify. And we think that the best way to leverage the, the greatness and the passion of all these people is to trust them to do the right thing 
and uh, use their capacity for problem solving. And we also want to build an organization that can experiment uh, a lot uh, and learn quickly, iterate fast, uh, and that's uh, why autonomy is an important concept. And at the center of our organization is the autonomous squad. And all other features of our organizational design are built to support this autonomous squad. And it should feel like you're working for a mini startup, you're a small team, a very defined mission, you're working with your part of the product and you feel like you own that. And uh, teams are usually no more than five or seven engineers, uh, rarely uh, more than ten. They're self-organizing and cross-functional. And uh, the product owner and uh, an agile coach uh, are also included in the, in the autonomous squad. Yeah. So by cross-functional we mean that everyone who needs to be on the team should be on the team. And that includes QA people, UX people, front-end devs, back-end devs. It really depends on what the team is working on and what their mission is. And some examples of uh, missions or teams are <coughs> that you have the playback team. They're in charge of uh, everything that's related to playback. Make sure that the song starts immediately when you press play, that there is no latency and uh, no hiccups. And you have the playlist or collection team. They handle the collection parts. Then there's the what's new team uh, that manages the, the start page that you arrive to when you, when you fire up the desktop client. And also, uh, another example is the iOS uh, team. And they're making sure that you can, all the other teams can deliver fast on iPhone and uh, iPads. Yeah, and so they really own this, their product as well. And, and so one of the key things that we really try to achieve with those squads is that they really own the product and take the release, uh, the release decision. So they should be able to release independently, uh, but also uh, to be the ones to decide wh when is this good enough for our customers and when can we reach out. And they also work with this for a long time, so they stay stable over a very long time. Yeah. And uh, our new office that we built in Stockholm is designed to support uh, the squads. So we have uh, small squad rooms, so you can't basically fit to more than 10 people. Uh, if uh, you try to squeeze more people in, it's a pretty good signal that you should maybe split the team in two. And uh, each, uh, it's uh, open but gets closed off, quite optimized for, for collaboration. And every squad has a small lounge connected to their squad room, so you don't have to book meeting rooms or anything. You just have a you have a monitor, and all the cables are already there. You can have impromptu meetings, plannings, retrospectives, whatever, and a small meeting room where you can sit and talk on the phone or have one of those. You might also see that we put whiteboard uh, wallpaper on all the walls, so it's whiteboards across the room. So it's really easy to go up to any wall and start having a conversation or, or solving problems. And uh, next to the school rooms, we have a lot of uh, areas for spontaneous meeting where, where people can run into each other and uh, serendipity will you. And a very big part of being autonomous is to decide how uh, you want to work. What process do you want to use? And uh, well, that very much depends on the, your context, your various uh, circumstances, and the uh, team composition, and so on. And we used to be pretty much a Scrum shop, where Scrum was mandated. Uh, we quickly abandoned that idea, but still, Scrum was uh, considered a de facto standard. Uh, so even if it wasn't Scrum by the book, it was some kind of Scrumish experience. Uh, we even had uh, synchronized uh, three-week sprints for most teams in the company. But as we grew and uh, started emphasizing autonomy even more, uh, some people started trying out two-week sprints, one-week sprints. They were no longer synchronized. Some moved into some kind of continuous flow. And we actually did a, a quick poll before coming to this conference. I, we went around and asked squads, 39 of them at least, so what would you say that you were doing? Scrum, Kanban, neither? And this is the answer we got. So only about the left was using Scrum. Yeah, Kanban asked that uh, when they said, uh, well, uh, neither really, but more Kanban-ish than Scrum. And actually someone said, if anyone else was asking, I would say Kanban, but because it's you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, and a lot of these implementations are pretty shallow, not using grid payments or anything, but uh, they seem to be willing to move in the direction towards Kanban, and some of them are really deep yeah. implementations. And so something we often see is that when we start up new teams working with a new product, they will usually go towards a more Scrum implementation, and that seems to work for them when they work on like their new product. And but as they get closer to to releasing and have it live with real customers, they tend to move towards shorter sprints and then eventually to just in continuous flow of, of value. Out there, that was. Uh among others, there was one team that said, I'm not sure what we're doing, but we're probably a bad example for everyone. So, <laughs> Jeeves? Uh, so, we're trying to make it really explicit what we mean with an autonomous squad, uh, and this is uh, our current definition. Uh, every squad should have a dedicated product owner that can. Uh, be the, the, the channel between uh, the rest of the company, or at least one person who keeps in touch and aligned with the rest of the organization. Uh, we have an agile coach for every squad. Uh, every squad should be able to influence their work. Every team member should be able to find influence in the work. So our product owner is not a product owner in the traditional Scrum sense. It's more like a business value expert, or, or as the our keynote spe speaker said today, a uh, uh, product. Uh, Sure. No, product is good. Sure. <laughs> like and, uh, that. It should be really easy to release and, and get stuff live. It's very important to be autonomous. <coughs> yep. Yeah. Oh. No, sure. So, uh, and also a process that fits the team that we talked about. Uh, a really clear mission, and most of the work that you're doing should be aligned with this mission. If it's not, that's probably a sign that maybe you should split the teams. Maybe you should try to say no to certain things and we write, redirect that to other teams. And every squad should also have the organizational support <coughs> that they could expect. Uh, senior management drive needs, uh, oh sorry, we'll talk more about that later. Senior managers uh, supporting them and know uh, who to ask for help uh, and support. Yeah, and so we have this definition of what it means to be an autonomous squad, but we don't, don't want to stop there and say, yeah, this is how it should be and then leave it at that. Uh, so we started doing service and actually ask our squads in how is actually it's working. So once every quarter or at least every half year, we go out to every squad and we ask them uh, how they would rate themselves on each of those areas. And, and so we ask every squad member to, to rate them, the whole team, in how they're doing as a team. And then we put the whole squad together and discuss the results. Um, and so. This will bring up a lot of good uh, discussions within the team. Uh, so it's a, it works as a kind of uh, retrospective for the team, but it also works as a great feedback to us to know how far we, how we come as an organization uh, towards our visions. We want every squad to be really autonomous, but are we really there or not? Uh, and because we do this every quarter, every half year, we also get historical data, so we can also start looking at trends and see, is it improving or are we actually getting worse in some areas? So this is a result from half a year ago uh, that shows us that they're doing fairly okay, but they definitely have problems with these, their releasability and, and getting the product out. So that was a, a clear area what, where we needed to improve. And because we measure this with like one squad, we can also take all the results and put them together. So this is a result from, I think, from a year and a half ago from New York. And it gave us a lot of feedback on, on how are we doing as an organization, not just, not just for team to team, but it, started, it gave us the possibility of starting to see some patterns that we wouldn't have seen otherwise. So, for example, this showed us that, yeah, there's a clear problem with agile coaches here. We have, we're probably missing an agile coach, and, and so we need to hire something, someone. And that's something that a team couldn't do themselves, but the organization needs to help them out there. It also showed us that there's several teams here that are having problems releasing, and it's, so it's a common problem, and it doesn't seem to get, be getting any better. So we need to invest heavily into building more infrastructure or making it easier to release. And, and as part of this, we've started acting on changing our whole architecture and doing a lot of th things. And it's not like we couldn't see this uh, uh, through talking to the teams or, or hearing things, but uh, all of you should know that the difference between anecdotal uh, evidence and, and actually hard data. This is 
Yeah. So another outcome that we've had from this was to to start changing how we structure all the teams in New York so, uh, and how we did leadership in New York. So it's a fairly big change that come out from those surveys. Okay. So. Uh so this is an aspiration and some something that we're striving towards uh, uh, to be really autonomous squads. Uh, everyone, everyone's not there yet. Uh, and uh, also it's not a, a question of complete autonomy, like teams running around uh, any way they like. We still have one product and one common shared goal. So a big challenge was having these autonomous squads and growing so rapidly as we are is to how can we still keep some kind of alignment and, and coordination and, and learn between the different squads? So we've divided these challenges with growing into two parts. And one is basically how we structure uh, the company uh, in order to be able to support all these uh, mini startups or autonomous squads and make sure that the learning and sharing happens and that we see opportunities for consolidation and so on. And the other one is how do we create alignment between the different squads so we can uh, foster collaboration and uh, achieve bigger goals than, than any one of the squads could do independently. And this is what the rest of the, the talk will be about, these two challenges. So besides being part uh, of a squad, every engineer is also <coughs> a member of a chapter with uh, people of the same, uh, with the same special skill set. So for example, we have uh, QA chapters, uh, web development chapters, backend development chapters. And these chapters meet uh, about once a week, where they share knowledge, uh, uh, look at improvement opportunities. Uh, is there anything that we could consider consolidating or, or learn from each other and have a, a common approach to? Uh, is there anything that we can learn in general uh, from each other? And they also identify common challenges with the architecture or, or tools and uh, these things. And every chapter is led by a chapter lead, which is also the hiring manager for, for everyone in the chapter. But it's a, it's a servant leader that's very focused on coaching and sometimes mentoring uh, the direct report. And he's an, uh, he's an engineer, just like you. He's still actively working as an engineer. Often it's about 50-50 uh, working with management uh, things and 50% uh, actively working in a squad. Uh, you usually meet your uh, chapter lead uh, weekly in one on one. And uh, sometimes the, the chapter lead will be working in your squad, other times uh, he's not working in the same squad as you are. Uh, sometimes there are two chapter leads in the same squad. Uh, the point here being that the chapter lead is definitely not a team lead or a squad lead. They're a servant leader that will help you to develop and, and grow as a craftsman. Yeah, and this whole model of having the chapter leads being sometimes you, your chapter lead will be part of the same squad, but the fact that he's clearly a chapter lead and also have uh, chapter members in other squads make it very apparent that he's not the one deciding from day to day what you will be working on. He's just there as a mentoring support to help you grow or to help you solve problems whenever you run into them. Uh, but not in terms of like directing or micromanaging you. And it's important to us that the, the chapter lead or the, the management track is not the only uh, personal development or, or career path uh, open to engineers. Uh, we're currently experimenting with something that we call add-ons, add-ons, which means that you can become an expert in, in a field, for example, a C++ expert or a teacher or a mentor. We have these different add-ons. And by calling them add-ons, we want to emphasize that it's not a upwards moving career path. It's uh, like, now I want to try out the being an ex expert. Now I want to try the uh, chapter lead. And if I go back to just being an engineer or taking on another challenge, it's not a, it's not a failure. It's not a step backwards. It's just another add-on or not. And we also have a lot of training programs and knowledge sharing. A lot of our engineers are, are really, really good at what they do. Several uh, write books and, and uh, train people uh, before they came to Spotify. Uh, so we have training, lunch and learns, tech talks, webinars, practice <coughs> sharing, the management uh, training, leadership forums. And these go a long way to actually share knowledge and, and uh, yeah. uh, find the consensus around things. Yeah, and we think this is really important that 
even though we have those very autonomous groups, we make sure that they do a lot of knowledge sharing and training across the company. So, so we don't build those small islands of, of, of trying, like finding, building competence, but not sharing with the whole company. Thanks. Right, so we have the, the squads and we have the chapters. And this worked really well for us as a, uh, as a scaling mechanism or uh, supporting autonomy, as a way of supporting autonomy for a long time. But we started seeing, when we became more than like 150, 200 people in tech, we started seeing a lot of problems that seemed to have the same root cause. So what we started noticing is that people don't know each other anymore. They don't know each other's names. They don't recognize everyone by face. And they certainly don't know the specialties or uh, specialties of each other or know what you're working on or what they could turn to you to get help with. Um, so we started realizing that we need to create like a smaller context for them, those people, and a smaller family where they could really know everyone that they work with. So we created something that we call tribes. And so tribe is a way to creating a much smaller context for every engineer. So they have a smaller, a smaller group of people that they really can know well and really collaborate closely with. Uh, so a tribe would be a, a subset of, of all our squads and, and we group them together. And so currently we have six tribes in the company and a tribe could be anywhere between three squads up to, I think the biggest one right now is ten, nine squads. Um, and those tribes are for formed around having the same mission. So for example, we have a tribe that's the music player tribe and their mission is that they want to provide fast and re reliable access to all the world's music. So they're really focusing on the core experience of what Spotify used to be uh, when we launched the service a couple of years ago. And so each of the squads have different missions, but they're all in line with, with this bigger mission. So they're all trying to focus on, on the core experience. And having those, their missions are very tightly aligned. So that means that they have a lot in common. And, and that means bring them into a tribe together. They can start solving a lot of problems together and then start collaborating very closely within this tribe. Uh, other tribes are focused more on having the same context, the same uh, circumstances that they work in. Uh, so uh, another example of that is the infrastructure tribe, uh, working with building really good infrastructure that the rest of Spotify can build services, systems, and products on. And being an infrastructure squad means that you're working on a piece of infrastructure, and they, all the different squads work on very different things. Uh, so their missions are not really closely aligned. <coughs> But the fact that they're all in this infrastructure type and work with infrastructure means that they can learn a lot from each other when it comes to how do we engage with the rest of the company or what does it mean to be uh, a squad working with infrastructure. So they learn a lot from each other by being in the same set of circumstances or working with very similar things. So we, those tribes often bring people together in a good way and the tribes that have very t tightly aligned missions and are formed around a strong mission, they will be meeting every three weeks or so and running product demos together and, and checking what is our progress and can we do anything more together to get even faster towards our mission or move even faster towards our mission. And infrastructure squad, for example, they will also meet every three weeks or every now and then, but they will focus more on knowledge sharing and, and learning. What can we learn from each other? What have the others started experimenting with that we can also use within our squads? So I think that we also noticed at Spotify is that those tribes now start experimenting with different ideas in each tribe. And so it's, it's really a good way of trying out a lot of different ideas across the company. So one tribe will be trying a, a new form of, of leadership groups with product owner, team leads, and agile coaches getting together. Uh, so that's something that the infrastructure tribe has started doing. And because it seems to be working really well, it also spreads to other tribes. Uh, so we have a lot of those examples where, where and a tribe come up with an idea and try it out, but we don't need to try it out across the whole organization. We can try it in one place, and if it's good, it sometimes spreads. But the tribes are also not hard boundaries, so we want the squads to really work with the squads that they need to interact with. Uh, so if you're building a product, you will have to, to work with a lot of other squads in the company to really fulfill your mission or to, to build your product. Uh, so, so if you're building an end feature, uh, uh, end user fa fe facing feature, you will have to interact with perhaps with the infrastructure squads because you're building on some infrastructure for example. 
so we never want the tribes to be hard boundaries and them, so you don't have to go to your tribe lead and he goes to another tribe lead and they do the interaction. We always want squads to work directly with each other one on one and solve their problems and work, collaborate on, on their current problems. And so that really creates a network organization where people just work directly with each other. And we've also started seeing that this network organi organization is co constantly shifting and moving around. So a squad will be working together with another squad for two or three weeks until they've solved that problem. And then they don't have any collaboration anymore because they've solved that problem and they move on to, to work with some other squad. So it's really shifting and changing all the time. And so all of those collaborations are sort of dependency. Uh, we went in to think about dependencies thinking that dependencies would be something bad and we should remove all dependencies. And what we learned was that usually it's called a dependency when it's not working very well. And when it's working well, it's called a collaboration. Uh, <laughs> so we, we also have some very good dependencies that actually work well. And so our goal is not to remove all dependencies. Uh, we just try to make them work very well and then remove them if they're not necessary. But when we went into the whole tribe structure, we thought that it would be a problem. We, we, we had the goal of having tribes be completely autonomous. But what we've realized is that autonomy doesn't mean independence. So uh, there will be a lot of interaction between the tribes. We actually built in a lot of the uh, dependence between tribes. So for example, by having infrastructure tribe and then building features on top of that. Of course, there's going to be technical dependencies. There's going to be product dependencies. There's going to be knowledge dependencies. There's all sorts of dependencies. Uh, and our goal is not to remove them. We just want to make them work well. Uh, so when we went into tribes, that was one of the fears. So we started measuring how do the dependencies actually look right now in the company. So we went out to every squad and we asked them, what other squads are you working with right now and what dependencies do you have? And so we collected all this information and we also asked them, how is it working for you? Is it working well? Is it slowing you down? Is it even blocking you from doing what you think is the highest priority right now? Uh, and this gave us a lot of information and that's also then when we started realizing that uh, we've actually built in a lot of those dependencies. We've uh, formed the company to have dependencies. So the goal is not to remove them, but to make them work really well. Did that conversation also include dependencies around the individual tribes or squads infrastructure things? So you mentioned earlier about deployment and what have you. I assume that there's a set of tools that either some small group of people or all of the people are using. Did this conversation include the yeah. things that they are dependent on? So the question was if this is included also uh, uh, Tools and, tools and infrastructure that everyone will use, and they definitely did. So one of the things that we learned from asking our squads around this was that as much as a third of our uh, squads were blocked or slowed down by operations, so everyone was using the operations department uh, uh, to get machines when they wanted to launch a new service. And that took a long time because they had to set up the machines manually. Uh, and so we learned from this survey that this is a big problem and a third of our squads are affected. And so we moved into this more like self-serve uh, uh, we are working with, with uh, setting up machines. So that's just one example of, of doing exactly that. Yeah. And, uh, a lot of new people uh, at Spotify uh, are a bit surprised at the apparent lack of structure. Uh, so who is coordinate, coordinating this? Who is in charge of making sure that this happens? Who, uh, wh where is the forum where, where this gets decided? And we don't have that. Uh, and they just hear, oh, this is chaos. But after you've been working here for a while, you understand that structure happens when it needs to. Uh, a lot of people just collaborate without, there's no, there's no visual trace of it. They just collaborate. And uh, I think that has very much to do that we believe in autonomy, not only for teams, of course, but for individuals. And with autonomy also comes a lot of responsibility. And that's a, a, a central part of the culture. Uh, our CTO, for example, talks about it constantly, our, our CEO as well. Uh, he, the CTO recently wrote a, a, an internal blog post called Make Shit Happen. So if you have a complaint, if there's something you're not satisfied with, if, not something, if something is not working, you're not allowed to complain about it. You just fix it. Make shit happen. You're empowered to do it. Just take some time out of your schedule and, and, and fix it. And I think that's a, 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 a happening all the time.
this, uh, for example, is uh, Antash. Yeah, so this is a picture from a bigger project we were running. So we had eight different squads collaborating for, for four or five months building our web player. And, and so that was initially chaos when we got all those eight squads together. And so structures started happening and we started having scrum of scrums or meeting daily to talk about blockers and dependencies between the teams uh, just because we had to. Uh, so that, uh, that's a good example of, of when structure happened and it happened just for as long as it needed to. So when the project was over, when we found that we actually don't have that many blockers and problems right now, we stopped having those meetings. So it's, uh, yeah. An important part is that it wasn't really a scrum of scrum, but yeah. more a daily, there's a time and a place, everyone from all of the squads can come. It's good if at least someone comes. And usually there were several people from, from the squads uh, gathering, but they felt that they needed something. So at least one point to, to make contact uh, every day. Yep. Uh, another example is uh, uh, where we, the web player realized, okay, we have a lot of requests from people uh, that want to release and so on, we get a lot of questions, so let's start having a, a, a coffee meeting, FICA, let's say in Sweden, uh, every Monday at, at 5 o'clock, and those who want to come uh, and say that if they want to release something or want to know what we're doing, they can come. It's not a mandatory meeting because of opt-in. Yep. And uh, one challenge uh, with, uh, when we uh, started with tribes was that uh, how do we make sure that uh, collaboration is happening cross tribe or information is shared. So the first idea we had was to have all the chapters form a guild. So uh, all the web development chapters in all the tribes form a guild for web development. Uh, we quickly realized that we're actually trying to say that people should not be uh, stuck in their roles, they should uh, not consider themselves just QA and so on. So we quickly changed it to be an uh, uh, opt-in. So you're automatically a part of uh, the web development guild if you're a web developer, but you can also uh, opt-in to other guilds or opt out of the web development guild if you would want that. What we've seen lately is uh, special guilds uh, forming to, to meet uh, new challenges. For example, uh, we have several squads that are really, really good at continuous delivery. Others are struggling to, to come up to speed with that. Uh, so we created a guild where you can meet and, and share uh, knowledge around that if you're interested in it. And uh, there's uh, the activity that's going on in the guild that varies a lot uh, from guild to guild. Uh, the Agile Guild, we have a, a weekly FICA, Lean, Lean Coffee, for instance, where everyone can come. And uh, others have more mailing lists and so on. But something that's becoming very popular, uh, happens uh, once or twice every year, it looks, is uh, a guild on conference. So everyone in the guild from all over the world, all the, dev all the, all the web developers meet for a day of an conference, starting with uh, a lot of lightning talks, interesting topics, and then open space sessions. And uh, a lot of, of uh, consolidation opportunities are discovered, a lot of uh, structure happens in these too, as, as people realize we have the same challenges, let's continue to work on this uh, after the conference. Yeah, um, so the other challenge that we have is how do you create uh, alignment when you have all this autonomy? So a lot of people seem to think that if you have autonomy, everyone will just be focusing on their mission and running towards their goal and without coordinating with others. Uh, and with any company, really, what you want to achieve is having all the teams or all the parts of the company moving the same direction towards the same goal. And we find that a lot of people seem to think that those two are kind of opposed, that either you get autonomy or you get alignment. Uh, and we think this is, might be a problem. So we start to think about them as two different dimensions. You can either, you can have high alignment or with low autonomy, and you can have high autonomy with low alignment, but you can also achieve both. Uh, so an example of a, a highly aligned company with low autonomy would be a very top-down organization, right, where you have uh, micro decisions from the top just filtering down. Everyone are doing those micro decisions, so they're probably running in the same direction. Uh, but they don't have a lot of autonomy. Or you can have a very entrepreneurial organization that's very chaotic and everyone running in different directions. And I would say Spotify, I've been down here. We were fairly entrepreneurial and slightly chaotic. And what we're doing right now is trying to move up to being an, inno an inno innovative organization where we really collaborate towards the same goal. Uh, so we're trying to get more alignment, 
but without getting, but without removing autonomy. And so, do you want to talk about, about yeah. how we do that? So one example is uh, it's very important, of course, to have a shared vision. Uh, so we spend a lot of time uh, communicating vision, talking about vision, vision, and establishing it. We have uh, strategy days, product days. We have introduction days for new employees. Uh, we have a tech and product meeting for everyone every three weeks, and, and this is an example of a, a town hall that we have every two weeks, about every two weeks, uh, where our CEO addresses the entire company, which is video conferencing, of course. Uh, this, is our, this is our stage in Stockholm, and he talks about tactical and strategic things uh, that's important for everyone to know. And uh, at the end of every town hall, all of the C-level people, chief product officer, <coughs> chief technology officer, and so on, gets up to the stage for, for Q&A. You can ask him anything. And we're very, very transparent to everyone inside the company about what's going on and, and our plans for the future. And uh, we use uh, as a tactical tool for, for quarterly uh, objectives, we use OKR, Objectives and Key Results. Uh, that's basically the only formal tool that we use for alignment. And usually, uh, the top management has a good idea on what the objective should be for the next quarter. Uh, but it's discussed a lot with uh, uh, individuals and department heads and so on. So uh, it's kind of first start with the objecting, cascading down a little bit, uh, you get feedback, and, and uh, uh, after a while you establish uh, the quarterly goal. And everyone has an OPR except uh, engineers because they work together towards uh, the, the shared goal of the squad rather than having individuals. <coughs> And uh, uh, one example of an OKR can be, so uh, we need to get the, the new discovery paradigm for music delivered uh, or demoed uh, in New York on December 6th, which was supposed to be. Uh, so some, some uh, people in the organization will have very little to do with that, so it won't inform their object objectives. The important thing is that you have a dialogue with your peers and your leadership uh, around what should my OKRs be. Can I assist with the impact that you choose to be the company? Yeah, and so discovery is a good example where we have also used projects to, I think we'll have to wait with your question, sorry, uh, where we used projects to bring a few squads closely, closely together. So through this intense syncing and planning together and running demos together, uh, they get very, very good alignment between those squads and we make sure that they are running towards the same goal, very focused. And another uh, way of aligning that we recently started uh, experimenting with is uh, challenges. So there was a lot of talk going on in the company that with the current size, we should be able to get uh, things out faster. And of course, uh, some spots are, are slower to get things out, some are, some are faster, so nothing is true for the entire company. And with a more authoritative model, maybe we would say, so we need to get faster. This is how we're going to do it and have some kind of change initiative. But with the autonomy approach that we have, uh, at the tribe level, we, we started with, uh, or technology level, at the tribe level, we started with a challenge. So we're visiting all the squads and saying, okay, so would it be possible for you to double your speed? What would it take? In order to do that, we need to understand what's the current speed? What's your cycle time? How would you want to measure your cycle time? Would it be worthwhile to do that? And when you do it, how much do you think you can improve it? Can you set a target for yourself? And some sports would say, we're not really interested, we don't think speed is, a, is our, our uh, current challenge, mm -hmm. we think quality is, and you can opt in and opt out uh, to uh, the degree that's uh, uh, fitting for you. And when we set this challenge, we also had to make it very clear, explicitly clear, that we're talking about sustainable speed here. So working harder, working overtime, or doing like uh, <coughs> shortcuts to, to increase your speed was not acceptable at all. <coughs> And uh, uh, another concern with the tribes uh, was that uh, who is doing, uh, uh, who's making sure uh, to look at the whole picture, the organizational improvement. So Andrew coaches, uh, together with management and tribe leads and uh, our people operations group, are constantly uh, looking at uh, what do we have to do on a company level or technology level in order to improve. Yeah, and so in Spotify we really have improvement on all levels. So from the organizational level where we talk a lot about improvement to tribe specific improvements, they do a lot of improvements within the tribes to squads doing the retrospectives and trying to improve their small world and, and also like personal development, improving yourself. 
and this is really key to us. Like we, the Spotify is changing so fast as a company, we're growing very fast, but also the whole world around us is really changing very fast. So we need to constantly change and constantly improve. And this is core to everything we do, basically. So the only thing we really know is that, well, yesterday's solution won't be any good tomorrow. We'll have to come up with something new. Uh, and this is really like going through everything we do, basically. Yeah, and there's the signal, yeah. So if you want to reach out on Twitter or, or, or on uh, email, feel free. Or just join us for lunch and have a discussion. And we'll be here for the open space tonight as well, if anyone else is going. Cool. Thank you.